If you really want to become wealthy sooner rather than later, you can't just save all of your extra money in your bank account. Sorry to every Indian uncle and auntie who keeps saying that you have to save as much money as possible to become wealthy. You can't also just put your money into a high interest savings account that your bank offers. And you can't just put a little bit of money into a 401k and hope that this is going to make you wealthy. If you really want to become wealthy sooner rather than later, you need to become a little bit more aggressive with your investments and make some investments on your own. Now this doesn't mean you have to spend all your time being a full-time investor, but this means now understanding that the more money money you put towards your investments, towards buying these assets, the wealthier you will become. And the sooner you can put money towards these investments, the sooner you will achieve this wealth. There are eight general areas where you can invest your money that I'm going to be talking about in this video. Number one is you can invest your money in yourself. Number two is you can invest your money into the stock market. Number three is you can invest your money into real estate. Number four is you can invest your money into startups. Number five is you can invest your money into cryptocurrency. Number six, you can invest some of your money into physical gold. Number seven, you can lend some of your money out. And number eight, you can also invest some of your money in physical cash because cash can be an investment position if you do it the right way. Now, the general rule of thumb when it comes to investing is when you take on higher risk, you have higher potential reward. That's why when you start a business, you have the potential to make millions and millions of dollars, even if you start with under $100. But the risk is you might fail. In fact, the odds are against you. Most startups will fail. However, if you're one of the few businesses that succeeds and you succeed really big, you can make a huge return on your money. Higher risk, higher potential return. So now as you've kind of factor in the different investment possibilities that you have, you can also factor in the different risk versus rewards to make sure the investments that you're making are aligning with your lifestyle. Maybe you just want a consistent, slow, steady return for the next 40 years. Maybe you want to see a much bigger return in the next 12, 24, 36 months. You got to decide what type of returns that you want and make sure that your investments that you're making are in alignment with the goals that you have. So let's jump right in. Number one is investing in yourself. This has been my biggest investment, especially over the last couple of years where I've been investing very heavily into my own business. Now I've always been investing in myself, but the way that you can invest in yourself is going to change with time and depending on what your goals are. In the early stages of me becoming an entrepreneur, me investing in myself meant I was buying books and I was buying classes. Nowadays, me investing in myself means that I'm investing into my own businesses. I have a few different businesses that I own and I operate. I have my Briefs Media Company, which has my free newsletters. We have a newsletter for investors called Market Briefs, and we have a free newsletter for entrepreneurs called Business Briefs. Then I have my financial education company called Market Insiders. This is a financial education app where users can get access to a suite of different financial education classes. And then I have Buzz Legal. This is my law firm. This is a law firm for entrepreneurs, people who have a business idea, who want to protect their idea with a copyright or trademark or a patent. My biggest investment nowadays is me investing money back into my own businesses. Before I started building my own businesses like these, I was investing very heavily into real estate and stocks. Those were my biggest investments before. Now it's kind of flipped because I can get a better return on my own investments. You know, like the saying is that you are your own best investment. Well, there's a lot of different ways you can invest in yourself. Before me building these businesses, I was investing into myself, into my own education. And it took a long time for me to really understand the different ways to build a business. I started a lot of different companies. I've been an entrepreneur for over a decade now. Some of my companies did really well, some of them didn't do well. And so you gotta figure out what type of education that it is that you want. Now you don't have to be an entrepreneur, but you can invest in your own financial education, learn how to invest your money, invest in books on how to invest in stocks or real estate or crypto or build a business. You can invest in classes, you can take seminars. There's a lot of different types of education, but you need to be investing in yourself. Now, the nice thing here is you have unlimited upside. If you invested $50,000 in yourself, you could learn what it takes to make a million dollars a year. If you invest $10,000 in yourself, you could turn that into $100,000. But you could also lose everything. So you have the high risk, but also the high potential reward here. Everybody needs to be investing in themselves. You have to be doing this to some level. At the very least, read books. 
If you don't want to read books, watch YouTube videos. If you don't want to watch YouTube videos, listen to audiobooks. If you don't want to listen to audiobooks, listen to podcasts. Listen to something educational. Start absorbing some sort of educational content, particularly in financial education. This financial education could be on how to invest your money into other assets, like the ones that I'm about to talk about, or it could be how to grow your income, whether it be through your job, or through building a side hustle, or through building a business. But you have to be investing in your own financial education and start with the free stuff, but then actually invest your money into it by higher level content, by higher level access, higher education that you have to pay for. Because what you'll find is when you pay for education, you're gonna even find a higher level of education. So be willing to invest in yourself. Now, I wanna go a little bit deeper just on the financials of this so you understand why I talk about investing in myself versus other investments. When I invest in my own business versus investing in real estate, the returns that I can get are very different. When I invest my money in real estate, for example, and we'll talk about this in just a second, my goal is to get a 7% cash on cash return on my money, meaning get a 7% return. When I invest my money in my business, I'm hoping to get many times that. Now, the difference here is in my business, it's much more risky, right? When I put my money into my law firm or to Market Insiders or Briefs Media, the business could go bankrupt. We could fail. The economy could go down and everything goes to nothing and now I have just a whole bunch of liabilities and no money coming in. So it's very risky on that end. But I'm trusting myself here and I'm betting on myself. And if I succeed, then I can see much more than a 7% return on my money. We could see a 200% return on my money that I put in. So it's a very different mindset versus putting my money into more of a passive type of investment where the goals for most passive types of investments, whether it's stocks or real estate, is generally somewhere between 5, 6 to 10, maybe 11, maybe 12% a year. So it's a very different type of return, but a different level of risk as well. The second way that you can invest your money is into the stock market. And one thing that I say, you might have heard me say this on different interviews, is that in this economic system in America, Every single person in America needs to be a business owner. Now, while I say everybody should be a business owner, that does not mean that everybody should be a business operator or a business manager. In fact, most people should not operate a business. So how is that possible? How is it that everybody should be a business owner, but most people should not operate a business? Well, that's because most people should not be in the business of actually managing or operating a business because most people are not entrepreneurs. Most people don't have it in them to be a CEO. However, everybody can be a business owner thanks to the stock market. The stock market allows every single person in America with as little as honestly just $1 nowadays thanks through the technologies that we have to invest in businesses. And when I say invest in businesses, I don't mean trading stocks because this can get kind of caught up in the weeds where traders are trying to find a stock and they're trying to flip it in the next day, the next six months or the next year. When I talk about investing in a company, I mean I'm actually owning a piece of that same stock but treating it like an investment in a business as opposed to just a stock. So when you invest in a company, now you're investing in a piece of the business, that way you can get your share of the future profits. It's a very different mindset and a different analysis and it's a different way of looking at your stock market investments because when you invest your money for the long term in the stock market, the day-to-day swings, the day-to-day market crashes, the day-to-day market booms, they don't matter. You're investing your money for the long term. So now what you're doing is you're looking for a good value or an undervalued investment that you can hold on to for the long term because you like the investment. Uh, There's a lot of different strategies to how you can invest your money in the stock market, but there's two general ways that I invest my money into the stock market. One is a passive strategy, one is a more active strategy. A passive strategy is on autopilot. And the way that this works is every single week, for me it's Wednesdays, it does not matter which day you pick, but every Wednesday I have money that gets pulled out of my checking account and it's automatically invested into my portfolio of ETFs. An ETF is an exchange traded fund and you can invest in ETFs, mutual funds, index funds. I have other videos on my channel where I explain what the differences are, but these funds are not investing in individual companies. You're now investing into a basket of companies. So instead of me investing into the Amazon company, I'm investing into a fund that gives me exposure into say 500 different companies, one of which is Amazon. So this reduces the risk because if Amazon went bankrupt, then all of my money would be gone if I was only investing in the Amazon company. But if I'm investing in a fund with the Amazon company and 499 other companies, and then Amazon goes bankrupt, well, that loss is going to be balanced out by some of the winners. Likewise, 
the ETF also balances out some of the big winners because if Amazon took over the world and I was investing directly into the Amazon company, now I would see a huge return. But if I'm investing in an ETF, that Amazon taking over the world would also be balanced out by some of the losers. So ETFs are a way for you to kind of lower some of your risk, but you also don't have to keep up with the ETF like you would investing in an individual company because, well, that's why I invested in a fund. That way it's completely passive. It's passive and automatic on my end. So I have a portfolio of different ETFs and I've already created this. I looked into different types of ETFs that I wanted. Most of them are dividend producing because I like investing for cash flow because cash flow funds the guac flow. Dividends are cash payments that I get without me having to sell my investment. And so now I have this portfolio. Some of them are dividend paying, some of them are value, some of them are more on the speculative side, which are like innovation, techie, and then some of them are also in countries and companies outside of the United States to give me a little bit of diversification, so emerging markets. So I have this portfolio of ETFs that I like, and I have built this portfolio, and then every week my money is automatically invested into these ETFs, and I don't touch it. It happens without me doing anything, and whether the market is up or down, this continues to happen, nothing ever changes. On the flip side, I also have an active investing strategy. So that's my passive strategy. And then I have an active strategy, which is not trading, but here I'm looking for more individual companies that I believe are undervalued. So now let's say we see a market crash and I see a great price for a stock that I've been wanting to buy. Now I can come in and buy even more because I found a company that I like, that I want to invest in at a great price. So that's my active investing where now I'm looking for individual companies. I'm not doing a system where every two days or every week or every month money is going in. This is the opportunist side of me. So I'm looking for opportunities in the stock market. And when I see an opportunity, whether it's because a company is struggling and I believe this company is on the verge of a come up or it's because the economy is struggling and now good companies are getting hurt. In either case, I'm looking for a company that I believe is undervalued and that's when I come in and buy. This brings me to the third way that you can invest your money, which is in real estate. Now, a couple little points that you want to be aware of. If you do want to passively invest your money in the stock market and you're looking for a good brokerage, I'll put the link to which brokerage I use an affiliate link to them down in the description. Meaning, if you use the link down in my description, we will get compensated. That's just how affiliate links work. But definitely do your own research. There's a bunch of different brokerages out there. And second, a tool that can help you stay up to date on what's happening in the markets. That way you can invest your money smartly is Market Briefs. It's the free financial newsletter that I talked about where every day my team is breaking down what's happening in things like the stock market, the housing market, crypto, the global economy, and our own economy into a fun, witty, and easy to read email. You can read it in less than five minutes every morning and it's completely free to you. So if you want to join Market Briefs for free, I'll put the link to Hike and Join Market Briefs down in the description below. There are three main benefits to investing your money in real estate. Number one is you can get consistent cash flow. Number two is you're investing your money into a hard asset. And number three is you get tax breaks. Now, starting with the cash flow, when I invest my money in real estate, I'm looking for a 7% cash on cash return on my money. That means if I invest $1 into real estate, I want seven cents of cash flow every single year. If I invest $1,000 into real estate, I want $70 a year. And if I invest $100,000, I want seven grand worth of cash flow year after year after year. When I invest in real estate, I don't care about the upside potential. That's not what I'm looking at. When I invest in real estate, I'm looking at the cash flow because the upside potential is speculative. It's me hoping that I'm gonna be able to sell my real estate for a profit. I don't know what's gonna happen in two years, three years, four years, five years. So instead of me trying to predict what the value of my real estate will be, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to calculate how much cash flow I'm going to get because that cash flow is much easier to calculate versus how much I'm gonna be able to sell this property for in three years or 10 years. It's a much harder prediction. I don't really care if housing prices fall or if real estate prices fall because what I'm looking for is the cash flow that I'm going to get. And I'm gonna put in certain parameters that way even if I'm wrong in my cash flow, I'm still gonna be profitable. So what I'm looking for is a 7% cash on cash return. Now, the second benefit is you get to own a hard asset. And the best way to kind of demonstrate that is to compare it to the stock market. If you go and invest in, say, the Amazon Corporation, you're investing in a paper asset. You don't own anything physical, nothing tangible. And if Amazon sees their stock crash, well, now you can see your value drop in half almost overnight because you can see these huge swings in stock market valuations very quickly because the stock market is liquid and it can be very emotional. 
With the housing market or with real estate, it's a little bit different. You can still see swings up and down, but you're not gonna see real estate prices get cut in half in 24 hours like you could see in the stock market because, well, to sell a real estate property, whether it's a house, an office building, an apartment complex, whatever, it could take months, if not a year, to sell a building. So it's a hard asset, which has pros and cons, but the pro of a hard asset is you own something that you can see, feel, and touch. You own the land, you own the bricks, you own the windows, you own something that you can see, as opposed to with the stock market, you own a piece of paper, which says you own a piece of a company. The third benefit of investing in real estate is you get tax breaks. Now, as an attorney, I can tell you, who's not your attorney, that real estate has some of the biggest and best tax breaks that our tax code has to offer. Because now what it allows you to do is you can generate income from your real estate properties, but you could potentially claim a loss on taxes. And this is what you see many real estate investors do is you make a profit and you have cash in the bank, but on taxes, you can show a loss. Why? Because of the way that the different deductions work with real estate. You can, for one, depreciate the value of your building on your taxes. Essentially what that means is you get to make a profit. Say you made $10,000 in profit this year from your real estate investment. But then you get to tell the IRS, hey, I made $10,000 worth of profit. However, my building is one year older. And because my building is one year older, I deserve a tax write-off. Now your building could be more valuable. Your building could be worth more now than a year ago, but you still get to take this tax right off because your building is one year older. This allows now investors to say, I made $10,000, but I have $0 worth of tax liability. The amount of money that you can actually write off is going to depend on the actual value of the building. The bigger the value of the building, the more you can write off, the smaller the value of the building, the smaller your write off will be. This is where you want to make sure you have a good accountant on your team, but it's going to take more work because now you're gonna to have to have an accountant, you gotta have an attorney, you gotta have a broker, you gotta have a banker, you gotta have a contractor, you gotta work with the city, you gotta have a title company. There's a lot of different people that you're gonna to have to work with, but you get the three benefits. You get the cash flow, you get owning a hard asset, and you get the tax breaks of investing your money in real estate because well, real estate has some of the best tax breaks that is out there. Now, the couple of the biggest downfalls with real estate is it takes more money and the amount of work that it takes to actually invest in real estate. There are some workarounds on the money side. If you say, I, I don't have a lot of money to invest in real estate. Well, you could do something like creative financing, where now you're working with the seller to get money in addition to potentially the bank. But I would caution you here that you don't want to over leverage on your real estate. I know some people pitch this whole idea of going 100% into debt to buy a property. I don't recommend that because if you're over levered on real estate and you don't know how to manage the property or if real estate prices go down and a bank forces you to sell and you're underwater, well, now you're stuck. And if that happens, which happens all the time, now you might be forced to sell the property for a huge loss and then the banks can come after you for that loss. And in those situations where that property is sold for a big loss, I have been able to come in and buy many properties at a discount because somebody who didn't know what they were doing, maybe they listened to some real estate guru talking about why you should buy a property with zero money down and doing all these risky things. It can work. It works for a few percent of people, but for the majority of people, they will end up failing. But in that situation, then you end up selling it at a huge loss and then somebody like me comes in and buys it at a huge discount. So this is where if you're investing in real estate, yes, it does take money, period. Like you can't kind of work around that. But if you don't have the money, then you can work to get the money, whether it be through creative financing or you can get other investors. If you know wealthy people or if you don't know wealthy people, you can go to a real estate investing conference because every real estate investing conference around the country that happen in pretty much every state you always have investors that are looking for money to do some sort of real estate deal. So if you don't have the money, you can get the money from other people, get this investment. Or the last option is you can be a passive investor in real estate. And this is a little bit more tricky than in the stock market, but with technology, it's become much more accessible. Where now you invest your money into a real estate fund, and now you let the fund manager go out and invest your money. Now there's a lot of different ways to do this. The kind of traditional way was going to a real estate investor meeting and finding one of these investors or developers who is looking to build or buy a project, and then you can invest some money. Now you own a piece of the building, you don't get to tell them what to do, but you get a piece of the profits. So if they're collecting rents and they're making a profit, you get your piece of the profits. If they refinance out and they make a big profit, they'll give you some of the cash, or if they sell it for a big profit, they give you the profit. 
Is it risk-free? No, of course not. Every investment has risks. You're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. You might even lose money, which is why you should always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. But it gives you the opportunity now of investing way less money and also being completely passive so you don't have to worry about headaches. There's also apps on the internet. I have some that I have used, again, in the description. It's an affiliate company of mine where now you can invest as little as, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars into these funds and now you can get exposure to real estate. Same thing, are you guaranteed to make money? No, but it's a way for you to get exposure to real estate and make money in a different way without having to actually manage the property yourself. Fourth, you can invest some of your money into startups. Now, investing your money into startups falls into the high risk, high potential reward category because like, if you started a business, you're probably gonna fail. The odds are just against you. And when you invest in a startup, well, you're probably gonna fail because most startups will fail. That's just what statistics tell us. However, if you can invest into a startup that makes it big, well, now you can see huge returns. And now, thanks to technology and thanks to new regulations, it's become very easy and simple for regular people to invest in startups because now there's a lot of apps on the internet which allow you to invest in these startup companies and get a little piece of ownership. What are some of these companies? Well, you can look at Republic, you can look at Start Engine, and you can look at WeFunder. Now, while I'm not sponsored by any of these companies, I do gotta let you know that I am an investor in the WeFunder Corporation. Now, again, do your own due diligence. There's other platforms out there as well. So now the way that it works here is you can look for companies that are looking to raise money because there's a lot of startups that are always looking to raise money. And now you have the option to come in and invest, say, a couple hundred dollars into a company that's looking to raise money. And in exchange, you will get shares or equity in the company. Now, the downfall here is one is highly risky, but second, you don't get paid unless there's some sort of exit. And what an exit means for a startup means that this company either is gonna get acquired, meaning bought out by another company, or it's gonna go public. So it has to have some sort of liquidation event. So you could be waiting years to ever see your money again, or you might never see your money again because most investments will fail. However, again, the upside is if a company grows quickly over the next five years and they're able to 10X their valuation, now you could potentially 10X your money but again, you're most likely gonna fail. So the way that most startup investors look at it is, okay, I'm gonna try to invest my money into five companies, four will probably fail, but one of them will hopefully make it, and if I do it right, this one that makes it will make up for all the losses and make me a big enough profit to justify me investing in startups. So that's the pros and cons of investing in startups. For me, it's not a huge piece of my portfolio. I think it's less than 15% of my entire investment portfolio, but it's an option if that's something you're interested in. Number five, you can consider investing some of your money into cryptocurrency. Now, if you hate the idea of crypto, you don't believe in crypto, you don't understand crypto, don't invest in crypto. There should only be people who understand the technology and who want to get exposure to cryptocurrency and are willing to accept the risk. Cryptocurrency is also a highly speculative investment, meaning you could see your money go to zero and it's very volatile, meaning you could see huge swings up and down with cryptocurrency. If you're not willing to accept that risk, if you're not willing to see your money go to zero, don't invest your money in cryptocurrency. Now, for those of you who say, maybe I kind of want to invest in cryptocurrency, the way that it works is when you invest in cryptocurrency, you should not be trying to get rich quick. You should be trying to understand the actual technology behind cryptocurrency. That's why I invest my money in cryptocurrency. I have a passive cryptocurrency investment system where I'm investing in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a couple other coins every single day. It is completely passive and automatic. I don't care what's happening with the prices of cryptocurrency day to day. It's passive and automatic and it happens all the time whether the market's up or down and I understand that you're going to see huge swings up and down. It doesn't really phase me because I'm not investing for six months or two years. I'm investing for a long time into the future. Now for me, I understand the value of it because I like the blockchain technology. I have people that work for me that are overseas and trying to send the money previously through wires was one expensive and difficult because then I'd have to go to the bank, sign papers, sit there and do all that and then pay high fees to wire money. Like if I had to send money to a contractor in Turkey, it was a big pain because I kept having to go to the bank. If I was traveling, I'd have to come back and go to the bank and it would cost me like $40 or $20 or whatever it was. It was expensive to wire money out to Turkey. And if you have to do that pretty often, it can be a big pain. 
Then you had some online systems that were kind of created because PayPal wouldn't always work in these countries. But again, these online systems to transfer dollars weren't always the most seamless. You still had to sometimes go to the bank to approve certain things. So it was a big pain. But then with cryptocurrency, I was able to send my contractors overseas money with the click of a button. I mean, I could do it on my computer in just a few seconds. He would receive the money in just a few seconds. And the fees were a small fraction. I mean, the fees were like down from $20 or $40 down to just a few cents in fees. So the fees were way less. It was way quicker and way less friction and way less time. So that part I really liked. In addition, the blockchain gives you access to things like smart contracts. And there's a lot of other things that you can do with that technology where the traditional technology didn't allow you to do that. So there's a lot of value there. For me, that's where I see the value. And I do think that we're going to see more and more adoption. We're going to see booms. We're going to see busts. But there's where the value is for me. Now, again, I'm not trying to justify this as an investment for you. I'm not trying to tell you to invest in it. But I want you to understand that if this is something that you're interested in, it could be something that you consider investing in. Now, for me, cryptocurrency is a very small piece of my portfolio. Like I invest in all my other investments, my own business, real estate, stocks, all more than cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is one of the smallest investments that I have. So even if cryptocurrency all went to zero, well, it wouldn't really affect me. So you have to understand now how you're playing your investment portfolio and where different investments play a part in your portfolio. For me, it's, it's fun. I believe it's going to go up in value and I get kind of a little bit of excitement from that. But it's a very small piece of my portfolio. I'm not gambling with it with a big piece of my portfolio. The big chunk of my money is going into my own business, into physical real estate and into stocks. Then I have a little bit of speculative investments with things like my startups and the cryptocurrency. But this is where you got to understand now how you're investing your money as well. The sixth place that you can invest your money is into physical gold. For me, at the time of me recording this video, about 2% of my entire investment portfolio is in physical gold. And the reason why I invest in physical gold is not to see a return on my money. For me, it's an alternative way for me to save money. I consider it hard savings. It's kind of like doomsday protection where if everything went wrong, the dollar went to crap and the whole economy went into shambles, well, now I have some physical gold because gold is the traditional currency. It's been around since before humans were on earth and it'll be around after humans are here as well. So gold has that kind of intrinsic value because it is a limited supply and it takes time, effort and labor to mine physical gold. And again, for me, it's not a traditional investment. It's a way for me to save hard money. So I have a system where every month I have a automatic investment that's going to buy physical gold. This is not a gold ETF. This is not paper gold. This is actual physical gold. So for me, it doesn't really matter, again, what's happening with gold prices. I don't really monitor it that closely. Every month, I'm just buying a little bit more gold. Now, as a general investing knowledge tip when it comes to investing your money in physical gold versus something like, say, stocks, when you invest in gold, you're not getting any additional value and you're not getting any cash flow. Versus with stocks, like if you invest in the Amazon Corporation, the Amazon company is working to increase their value. They're working to send products to customers faster. They're working to sell better products. They're working to improve the technology. Amazon is always working to do something. When you own gold, it just sits there and looks back at you. It doesn't work to increase its value. So gold goes up in price when the value of the dollar goes down. So it's a hedge in that sense. And when you own gold, well, you don't make any cash flow versus if you own an investment, well, it could pay you dividends, it could pay you royalties, it can pay you rent. Gold doesn't have that option. That's why for me, gold is a very small piece of my portfolio but it's a hedge, kind of like an additional level of protection, kind of like insurance. The seventh way that you can invest your money is by lending your money. And this becomes more and more popular as interest rates go up because when interest rates are higher, you can lend your money for higher interest rates and which can make it a more attractive investment for you. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can lend your money out. You can lend your money to people that you know. You can lend your money to people that your people know. Or you can go through an online platform which allows you to lend your money to somebody else. Now, generally, when you invest your money, you want to have some sort of collateral, meaning some sort of security. If the person who borrowed your money can't pay you back, what do you get in return? Are you going to be able to foreclose on a property? Generally, you want like a real hard asset, like a property, not like a car, because cars can be depreciating. And while you can lend your money for a car, the car might not be worth as much as the loan amount. Now, you can see the same thing happen in real estate, but it's much more likely or more probable with a car than with real estate, because real estate prices do go up and down. But 
it's a slower moving process with real estate than it is with cars. So you want to have some sort of collateral, but then you also want to understand that you don't get any changes in your principal balance. So there's a lot of ways to lend your money, right? All the options that I talked about, you can also put your money in bonds. You can put your money into whether it's treasury bonds or corporate bonds. When you do that, you're lending your money either to the government, which is a treasury bond, or a corporation, which is a corporate bond. Now, the downfall here is, yeah, you get your cash flow, but you're not seeing any increase in your principal value, meaning you're not seeing any increase in the actual value of your investment. So the best way to explain that is to think about real estate investing. If you invest your money into a single family home, now yeah, you can get the cash flow, which is nice, but then if you invest in a good area, the value of your real estate might also go up. So you see an increase in your principal value. When you lend your money out, you're just putting your money out that's generating you this cash flow, which is the interest, but you're not seeing any potential increase in the value of your principal because you're not investing your money into any asset. You're just lending your money out to get a return. So it can be another way for you to generate some sort of cash flow, but just understand that you don't actually own an asset. You're just trying to get a return on your cash, where in this case, your cash is the asset. So you have some pros and cons here. And the eighth way to invest your money is by keeping your money in cash. Now, I know we talk about how cash loses value to inflation, but cash can also be an investment position, assuming you invest it or keep this cash strategically. Like if you're just saving all your money just to save it, now your savings are losing value to inflation. But if you're saving some cash looking for a good investment, now this cash is an actual investment position because you don't want to just throw your money into an investment blindly because you don't want to hold cash. Now, some people say, oh, but I don't want to lose my value to inflation. But if you overpay for an investment, you could see your investment drop by 20% or 30%, in which case it's better to see your cash lose some value to inflation than it is to overpay on an investment. Now, there's no perfect science to when you should invest. However, you want to be a patient investor and make sure that you're happy with the price that you're paying, in which case sometimes cash is a good investment. Now, the one thing that I want to say about cash is that nowadays, finally, at least we have some high interest paying savings accounts, online banks that will pay you at least somewhat of a decent return. It's not something amazing. You're not getting a 10% return on your high interest savings accounts. But at the time of the recording, you're seeing somewhere between three to 4% in interest from your high interest savings accounts. So it's a way for you to at least generate some sort of cash flow on your cash while you're waiting for a better investment opportunity. Now, again, you don't want to just be waiting forever, but you also don't want to just throw your money into an investment because you're worried about inflation. So you got to find the right balance for you and understand that for a period of time, cash can be an investment position as you're waiting for a good investment to come your way. Now, of course, I'm going to repeat this one more time. Investing has risks, but this is where you want to stay up to date on what's happening. That way you can be a more educated investor. Market Briefs is a super easy and free way for you to do that. I have the link to Market Briefs down in the description, but this is where you have to be investing in your own financial education. That way you can make better decisions with your money. I own a business. I need a laptop to run my business. So my laptop was an expense that I get to deduct from my income before paying taxes. I need a phone for my business. So I deducted my iPhone from my income. I had to go to San Diego last year. I had to go to Manhattan last year. I spent about two months in San Diego and about a month, month and a half 